Okay, so good morning, everybody. Uh, let's get started. Uh, so Tadashi will continue with his third lecture. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. So I'd like to now go on the topic of holographic calculation of entanglement entropy, no, namely holographic entanglement entropy. And in my first talk, first lecture today, I'm going to give some basics about holographic entanglement entropy and some recent developments with some properties of, of this entropy. And uh, in my second talk, second lecture, I'd like to give some recent applications, which we are uh, working quite recently. So this is section three, is a holographic entanglement entropy. So this is quite, so we just simply call HEE, holographic entanglement entropy. But before that, I just want to give some short summary of ADS-CFT because that's quite useful for my second lecture today. So we, we want to specify a basic coordinate system. This is ADS-CFT was discovered by Marda Sena, 1997. And so the claim is just, as you know, it's gravity, well, maybe string theory. It's originally derived in string theory on anti dosita space. And let's call this is an ADS D plus, plus D plus two. So this is my convention. Maybe people usually use D plus one, but this is quite useful because in this case, ADS safety argues. So it's like for home and few theory, um, uh, yeah, so it's a simple case, it's like D, R D plus one. So what D plus one dimensional conform of theory. In some case, we consider R times SD, the sphere. But anyway, D plus one dimensional conform of theory is dual to gravity in D plus two dimension, one dimension higher, because this is so-called holographic principle. And this has a negative cosmological constant, namely anti dosita space. So this is a basic claim of ADS safety. And so typically, so let's call this is some manifold M, then typically this is, this CFT is defined on this boundary of the space time. So if we have some bulk space M, then boundary, we have some holographic dual. So here we have a gravity, but as we can see from this Bekenstein Hawking formula of entropy, degree of, degree of freedom in gravity, it somehow looks like one dimension lower. That means just degree of freedom is proportional to area, not to the volume, entropy is not, proportional to volume, but it's proportional to area. So that suggests that it's gravity theory is equivalent to some non-gravitational theory. Non-gravitational theory is like quantum field theory or some quantum mechanics, many body quantum mechanics, which lives on one dimension lower space. And the ADSFT can be expressly understood in, the, in terms of the string theory, even though rigorous proof is still missing. This is a very important very future problem. And uh, so here, if we want to get some classical gravity limit, namely some general relativity or supergravity, then we have to take a particular limit of conformal field theory, so which is a large N, N is a degree of freedom, so the SUN gauge group, some gauge theory. We have typically this CFT is a gauge theory, and this is a rank of gauge group, and a large N limit, and strongly coupled. And in my talk, so I'm a, basically assume this condition. But we can also talk about some one over n correction and coupling constant, strong coupling uh, corrections in a perturbative way also. And sometime I've also mentioned that. But so anyway, so this anti-dosita space, we are going to focus on two different anti-dosita space. It's the most typical one. First one is so-called global ADS, and second one is called Poincar ADS. And we take hypersurface, Definition of anti dosita space. So in my convention, I take this way, uh, d plus 2 equal to some hypersurface, 1 square and blah, 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 x plus uh, d plus 1 in some two time space, right? R to d. So there are two time direction and uh, these spatial directions. So matrix 
looks like this. These two guys has a negative, so time like. Two time, another guys are positive. So this is the definition of anti doshita space, and obviously this has a symmetry. This has a symmetry, SO, or maybe I write it here. SO, <coughs> so you have two, time two. Huh? Ah, so this is radius, so you're right. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yes, I should put it out of scale. This is very important. <laughs> and which is identified as this Lie group identified as conformal. Conformal symmetry in CFT. And which lives on D plus one. <laughs> and then, so we introduce basic coordinate. This is it. Yeah, so it's good to put D plus two. Uh, yeah, that's D plus one. So these are, ah, okay, so it, it's, anyway, yeah. It's like R cos rho and cosine tau and R also cos and sine tau. And other guys are proportional to R, sine hyperbolic rho, and some spherical coordinate, some polar coordinate, which is called omega one, and it's like similar way, it ends up with D plus one. So these are guys are uh, equal one. <coughs> and then, so we can write metric, so just induced from this metric. On, so we can just reduce this metric on this hypersurface. So this is a quite well-known metric. So it looks like this. And this omega state, the omega scale is just a metric of S, ST. So this is a D plus two dimension. This is a one radial direction and one time. And you can write this picture. It's a quite standard picture. So we have a row direction. Ah, sorry, this, we have a tau direction. This is a time direction. And uh, we have some radial direction. Here it's a row. And this spherical direction is the way we write it omega i. So it looks like this. And uh, we see this boundary of this. This is called global radius. So this global means that it covers whole, whole part of uh, space time. And this is quite important in a later discussion of local excitation, which I'm. But anyway, this is global radius three. So this is the, it's called global radius three. And this boundary is, we can see that low goes to infinity, right? So boundary is here. So that means we have tau direction and omega direction. So that means R cross SD. And then, so this is related to this ADS safety correspondence, and it's bulk theory, bulk gravity is dual to boundary theory, which is where we have conformal field theory. And the second <laughs> coordinate is a Poincar ADS. So this transformation is quite important for my later discussions. Poincar ADS, D plus two, so this is a called global ADS. And so for this, we somehow relied these coordinates, these are basic coordinates, and in terms of different parameterization. So these are one parameterization, low tau. This is a very beautiful parameterization, but there are another uh, beautiful parameterization. So we combine this in a right to cone way, and we call this z plus z. X mu is a some Lorentzian coordinate. So mu takes a value, it's zero, one, two, and d minus one. Ah, sorry, zero minus two to up to d. So this d plus one dimensional conformal field theory appears here. And if we take difference, then a r is radius radius. So this is a ah, sorry, radius radius. So obvious, because it's uh, all metric is borrowed proportional to R squared. This measures 
size of anti-Doshita space. And also there are other components. D plus two looks like R x zero, this is a time direction, Z, and xi, which means i to one to d, one to d, they looks like R x i and Z. And it is very easy to confirm this constraint. This is a way to solve this constraint. And this guy gives very beautiful metric, very simple metric, which is known to be Poincare radius. So here, good thing is that we, we have this Minkowski space here, standard flat Minkowski space. So it's like R1D. This is a radial direction. This is a radial direction. So if we like pick, light picture, we find this, and this is a Z direction, and this means we are squeezing, right? If we go to large Z, that means that squeeze the space time, metric of space time, right? Well, it's proportional to always one over Z square, and uh, it gets divergent at, at some boundary. So also the same thing is true for uh, low goes to infinity is a boundary, but it's there where we have divergence of metric, and this is identified with UB divergence of conformal field theory. In quantum field theory, as we know, we have a ultraviolet divergence, and that's also essential in the computation of entanglement entropy. So at z equals zero, it's metric is divergent. So we put some, uh, normally put some cutoff here. So epsilon is very small quantity, but I'm going to mention this more later. But anyway, so this is a time direction x zero, and this is a space direction xi okay, here, and the z direction is warped. There's some warp to the dimension. And the boundary is here. So boundary is here. This is a boundary. ADS boundary. So in this case, uh, boundary of this Poincare ADS, C plus one, two, is obviously R1D. So this is R1D. This, is a these two guys are basic setup. Of course, there are many others, but this is quite relevant also my discussion later. But uh, at the same time, we should ask, so we should ask what's the connection between these two spaces. This should be the same, because it's come from the same definition. But actually, Poincare ADS covers only part of the space time. And if we look, so this global space, global ADS covers everything. So we can embed this Poincare patch into this global part. So that is given by, uh, maybe like this way. This way, and uh, we write some wedge here. The global radius is, of course, extended infinitely. Right? So we are particularly focusing on this wedge. So this is a, we cut along this line. This is a just neural direction. And this part is like tau is half of pi. And here it's like tau is minus half of pi. Pi half. And we look this region. So this shaded region is correspond to full region of Poincare ADS. And the, for example, one good pro is there some particle. We can imagine some particle is passing through the center, right? Center of global radius. That means just rho equals zero. Just rho equals zero. So particle, this static particle, just trajectory of static particle. This particle don't have any motion in this space, but we can map this trajectory here. This is very easy because we can Regard this rho equals zero condition, it just means this, all of these coordinates are zero. Right? So that means, for example, this guy is zero. Right? This guy is zero and this guy is zero. So that means these two guys are the same. Sorry, we, we set these two guys the same. Right? So that gives z square and xx mu equal to r square, but also these guys are zero. So that means this guy is zero. That means we cut it out xi equals zero. Right? Then this just gives team square. And this means that z, uh, yeah, z equal to square root of t square and r square. So this is a trajectory is like some moving particle. So it's like falling particle. So there is, this is a kind of horizon, right? Some, it's called black brain, right? So there are heavy objects here. So that means so particles are right, really attracted by strong gravitational force. And even if we start with some particle st state here, it's pulled by gravitational force and it's falling into the horizon. So it looks like this, but however, this trajectory it's like goes to minus infinity, 
2 plus infinity of time of the observer who lives on the boundary of Poincare radius. But in this coordinate, it just see it's only part of trajectory. Right? The observer really sits on this particle. It looks like more global motion. Right? That's all, uh, this global motion is covered only partially here. So this issue is quite important in late argument. Also, many parts of this area is safety. Yeah. And uh, so I just want to also mention about UV cutoff. So this is also very essential in the computation of entanglement entropy. So we basically in area safety, the Z direction, right? So you have a, you can see some nice symmetry, right? You can rescale the Z goes to lambda Z, some scaling, but at the same time, X mu goes to lambda X mu, the metric is invariant. So that means this is a kind of scale transformation, and this scale transformation is somehow equivalent to this shift of Z. So because of that, Z is identified as some length scale in CFT. So this is basic, this is called UVI relation, because this here is a metric divergent in this limit, that means it's quite infrared in a gravity viewpoint, but this infinite metric actually corresponds to the UV divergence in conformal you say. So, and then, but this tells us basically, this G direction is a length scale, and this is a kind of renormalization group flow. So this is a trivial renormalization group flow because we are talking about conformal theory, but if you have uh, some mass deformation, then you see non-trivial uh, renormalization group flow, and if you have a mass gap, end up with just some cap, cap to geometry, nothing here. So that means degree of freedom in large Z is missing. That means because of mass gap, no degree of freedom in the infrared. So that way, this, this is quite useful information. And at the same time, we don't write, we don't want metric di get divergent, so we put some cutoff We put cutoff here. This is a geometrical cutoff. In ADS viewpoint, ADS gravity. But however, this is dual to because of ADS safety, dual to, so this, this is actually UV cutoff. Safety. And in that sense, epsilon is regarded as a lattice constant in that is regularization. Or a momentum cutoff is like one over epsilon. <laughs> so this is a basic issue when we play with ADS safety. And also, basic principle, this is a more, or more very, very important thing, is that bulk to boundary relation. We're going to use this data to derive holographic entanglement entropy. And so this is work that by famous work, Gabza Kuleban of Korea, Britain, 1998. And this says that's a very simple thing. So if we compute partition function in gravity, then this is equivalent to partition function in CFT. Right? From here, you can say also entropy in gravity is equal to entropy in CFT. Free energy in gravity is equal to free energy CFT, and also you can add some external fields, some extra external fields, like some source or some magnetic field, uh, sorry, electric field, or magnetic field, and also gravitational field, then you can take derivative about external fields, and then get, you, you also find the correspondence of this correlation function and so on. So I'm not going to tell you this is quite, I mean, in some sense, classical, classic, uh, well-known fact, so I'm not going to detail, but so the partition function is equivalent. So now, so these are basic preparation for this next topic of this holographic entanglement entropy. So yeah, I'm, so now we're going to uh, next topic, which is a holographic entanglement entropy. So I would like to explain. This first, I give some and how explicitly how I'd like to give how we can formulate calculation of entanglement entropy in safety in terms of gravity and give some quick derivation later. So, but if, it is good to start with a simpler situation, namely if we have some static system. 
H, <laughs> this is a H holographic entanglement entropy for static, static space time, static background. So this case, point is that you can also do some Euclidean analytical continuation without any problem. So Euclidean space. Euclidean space. <laughs> and this is first found by uh, me and uh, uh, Liu, 2006. And I just first give some the basic calculation. So you can imagine this ADS CFT setup. I write it here again. So it is easier to do it in a Poincare coin, but you can do it on any different Poincare system. But uh, if we remember the definition of entanglement entropy in quantum field theory, basically, so let's take some time slice t equals zero to specify the Hilbert space, some state, and we decompose Hilbert space into two parts, right? Always bipartite, A region and the B region. Maybe you can also flip B and A, this is fine like this, and once you decompose space into two parts, then you can define entanglement entropy, which we wrote as SA, right? And in this case, it may be just a pure state like the same. <laughs> but for mixed state, this is no longer true. And uh, so this point is that, so this is a quantum mechanically in principle defined, but in ADS CFT gives some quite geometric calculations. So you can imagine this black hole entropy Right, that is given by area of black hole horizon. So the same thing happens for this holographic entanglement entropy. So the idea, so we have some extra dimension, which is Z direction, already introduced there. So we take some surface which covers region B. Anyway, this bundle is very important. This is obvious. And you, we explain some, something called area row and so on. So always proportional to boundary area and so on. So leading divergence should be proportional to area. And anyway, so we pick up some surface which is called uh, gamma A. This surface, you can call it gamma B, but in this case. But it's, let's call it the gamma A, which means that, so this gamma A satisfies the condition that boundary of gamma A is boundary of A. Well, maybe in this pure state case, it's gamma A of B, but uh, let's not talk on this. <coughs> we can talk about also mixed state case. Uh, yesterday I talked, I, I explained that why entanglement entropy is not so good quantity to characterize quantum entanglement for mixed state, but nevertheless, we can define entanglement entropy, and actually, in a holographic setup, that's actually quite a nice quantity, but though it's not count the number of EPR pairs and so on. So this, we impose this condition, and we also need to impose some topology condition, like these two guys are, right, you, you can, Imagine this A surface, maybe it is good to think A, but in this case, you can flip this because of pure state. So A region is a homologous to, to each other, to the gamma A. So this is a topological condition. <laughs> but anyway, so up to this condition, we find that this entanglement entropy is in CFT actually equal to the, some geometrical quantity, which is like minimum area surface. So we compute the area of this gamma A, right, for G Newton, and uh, we take a choice, all choice of gamma A, but uh, gamma A satisfies these two conditions. Gamma A is the same as boundary, and gamma A is homologous to this homology condition. Homo not homotopy, homology, it's homology condition. And uh, so we can compute. So this is a basic uh, claim of holographic entanglement entropy. <coughs> and we can check various properties before we derive this formula. So first of all, we know the basic property of entanglement, namely area law, right? Area law. So we should be able to reproduce area law. So this is very easy to see because you can see, you can compute this area of gamma A, which is, looks like, anyway, so we don't, we have to take a minimization, but obviously the metric divergence here should be perpendicular. The surface should be perpendicular to the boundary. So that means, you know, if we integrate metric, and if you remember this Poincare metric, which I write it here, so it looks like this. Some R, this radius, radius, some power of D, because, Always, this is D dimension. So this is very important. 
that this is D dimension, and that means co-dimension two. Right? Entropy is always associated with some co-dimension two surface. Because so that it's cancelled, dimension cancels with Newton constant. So it's like this. I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm will be careless about numerical constant. And we take integral of z, but this, we have z here. <coughs> and uh, so we, we know we have cutoff. Right now this cutoff plays an important role. So the, in principle, this is a metric divergent here, so it gets just divergent. We put some cutoff here, epsilon here. So integrated epsilon to some value, which I don't know, some value, we don't care, because we are interested in most leading, contrib uh, leading contribution, which is really localized at the boundary. Metric gets divergent here. <coughs> and of course, we have x integral, right? And this just gives an uh, area of boundary of A, D minus one. <coughs> so in this way, you, we find, roughly speaking, this guy and the integral of this gives some epsilon to D minus one power and the area of boundary of A. Right? and some subreading terms. But this is exactly what we expect for area law. This is the area law in the behavior. And this constant is uh, actually in even dimensional conformity. say this is like central charge. It's quite natural. It's proportional to degree of freedom. And odd dimensional case also still this is some good quantity to characterize degree of freedom. Sometimes related to f function and so on. So first test is somehow very easy. And now we go to the another issue of mixed state. Important issue in the mixed state versus a pure state. Yes? Do you really mean central charge or, I mean, in four dimensions, for example? What do you, I mean, is it roughly the central charge or? Yeah. Or so do, you, do you mean A or C? Yeah, because this is a, <coughs> I mean, leading order in a classical gravity limit. A, a and C is a I see, I see. Don't so make a difference. Uh, everything is degenerate. <laughs> so to see more details, we need to take into account corrections, higher derivative corrections. And the, yeah, this, another issue is this one. And we can imagine some black hole, finite temperature. Finite temperature black hole, ADS black hole is dual to, so just application, just generalization of HSFT tells us this is dual to finite temperature. CFT, uh, temperature is the same. Uh, we, just some black hole is, has a temperature, Hawking temperature, and that temperature is dual to conformal fuel theory temperature. And we can think about uh, situation. Now I, I switch to global ADS. So it's like a round shape boundary. So we have a black hole horizon here. So this is a black hole horizon. And we talk about entanglement entropy for particular region A. And let's take other region B. B is a complement. But however, in this case, low AB is not pure, right? Not, not pure. Actually, it's like low AB is equal to Low AB is equal to canonical ensemble, beta H, right? So it's not mixed state. So that case, something special happened. So, we, so we, here also, this homology condition plays a very important role. So we can imagine there are actually two different minimal surfaces which covers A or B. So this is a one surface which covers A, but we can have a, another surface which really end on the same place, like this way. But this homology condition tells us that this surface should be dual to A, and this surface should be related to B. So we call it gamma A and gamma B, they are different. In this zero temperature, this is zero temperature, vacuum CFT is described by uh, Poincare ADS. That case, this is, these two guys are the same, right? But this is no longer. Uh, uh, level, so he, this region is A, this region B. Inside is B. Yeah, inside is B, so this region is B. There, so we take a, a ADS3 setup, maybe, for, for simplicity. And then time direction is this direction. And this is a one circle direction, is a spatial direction in CFT. And this is a radial direction. Yeah, and these two guys are 
different. So entanglement entropy for A is just computed by area of gamma A divided by 4D Newton, and this is different from SB, which is given by just area of gamma B. So this is very special, and indeed this is consistent with what we know. Right? Only for pure state, SA equals SB falls, but for you know, this kind of setup, mixed state is not true. And the reason why gamma B is, looks a little bit larger is just it's also count number, uh, it also has a contribution from vacation hawking homer. Right? It's like almost wrapped. So that, means, that is actually a very classical correlation, and it's not related to quantum entanglement, as also discussed yesterday. But that's the reason we have some extra conditions. But nevertheless, this is quite important quantity. And we can see some interesting phase transition behavior here already. I come back to this, but later. But if we assume A is very small, A goes to very small, right? then A is just this region, and the other is B. Then so its surface is here, but you, you can imagine this kind of surface. And up to some region, this surface exists, but there are much smaller area because you always have to take a minimum. If there are several candidates which satisfy this condition, we have to pick up the uh, minimum one, minimum area one. So this here is the situation. There are this surface, but actually we should pick up another one, which just namely, it wraps here, and also just pick up this guy. So let's call this is a, a gamma black hole. So in this setup, this is a gamma A. This is just small surface is gamma A. Gamma B is identified this gamma black hole union gamma A, and gamma A is gamma A. So, if so, we will see that entanglement entropy for B minus entanglement entropy for A is the same as black hole entropy, which is just area of black hole horizon and divided by 4G Newton. So this is the one expressed uh, connection between black hole entropy and entanglement entropy. Well, so this is equal to thermal entropy, thermodynamic entropy, thermal entropy. So this is a one concrete way to say that the relation between entanglement entropy and some dynamic entropy. So in that sense, entanglement is sort of generalization of the standard thermal entropy, but it's sort of huge generalization. <laughs> and this relation is always true if we take a limit A goes to zero. But in holographic case, there are some, even though A is not completely shrinks to zero size, it's some finite, but it's very small, already this transition happens. This is a very sharp transition, and it's like sometimes called phase transition. This is very specific to holographic theory, like some conformal field theory dual to classical gravity limits of anti dositta space. I will come back to this issue later. Yeah, good question, but uh, actually minimal surface don't get into the horizon. Yeah, but uh, this is, that's the reason is that we are talking about static space. If you think about time-dependent black hole, you know, like a collapsing star, then actually it penetrates apparent horizon of black hole. And one more thing is some inequality, like something strong subjectivity, so which also we explain. This is very quickly, we can easily show this is, a, let us remember, uh, strong subjectivity is like this, A, B, C. This means A, A union, B union, C, and this B union, C. So this is very easy to show, and we can just schematically write it here. Everything just project down to two dimension, but you can imagine the same thing also true for higher dimension. So we pick up some region A, B, C, like this. And then this guy, SAB is some minimal surface, area of minimal surface here, SBC is a minimal surface here. Right? But this is obviously so smaller than ABC. So we can so we can imagine, right? So we can imagine this surface, yeah, you can think pick up only this surface, somehow we pick up this surface. Uh, this is really artificial. There are even cusp singularity, but they are actually much smaller surface. Area is smaller, this smooth surface. And also you can imagine this guy is like a very funny surface, but there are obviously smooth and surface which are smaller area. 
So, and this guy is just this guy, and this guy is just this guy. So, obviously, this inequality falls in holographic theories. <coughs> and then, Yeah, and then one more test is 2D CFT. So we, yesterday we derived the formula, famous formula, so of this entanglement entropy, 3C and log L over epsilon. And so if we take an infinitely long total space and subsystem its interval, <coughs> subsystem is some interval ring cell. And epsilon is a lattice constant. The P is also cut off here. And uh, yeah, we explained that. So we want to derive this in AD CFT, this holographic calculation. But this is very also very easy. So we know, actually, first of all, this length is, let's take a 2 over L and 2 over L. And this is a region A. This is a region A. This part is a region A. And then end point is here. And we have to find some minimal surface, but this minimal Surface is not surface, actually geodesic, right? It's always co-dimension two. And here we have in mind ADS3, dual to CFT2. So it's like co-dimension two guys are line, right? And we just want to think about whole, uh, geodesic links, geodesic line. So this geodesic line is actually turned out with just a very beautiful one, just a half circle, semicircle. So this is just described by, so this is a Z direction. And this is the x direction, and time is again fixed. And so this geodesic turns out with z and 4l square and x, uh, x square. And in, in a Poincare metric, eh? in Poincare metric, it looks like this. <coughs> and we fix time equals 0, so just two dimensional, this Poincare disk. And then this guy, you can rewrite this into using this surface. It's like this, L square and Z square and L square and 4Z square. And times DZ square. So this is just induced metric on this geodesic. Right? Then we integrate. So area of this, this geodesic gamma A, gamma A is just integrate. Uh, this metric. And z takes value from epsilon. We, we need a cutoff epsilon again. And up to this L over 2. Right? And we just integrate this guy. Rl divided by z and L square for z square. Right? And then this is very easy to do. And then we have log formula. The reason we get log epsilon divergence is just here. Right? So this is a kind of constant when z is very small. So we have a dz integral. Anyway, so that gives precisely uh, also no other term, no other constant term. And then, ah, right, right, sorry, you got a good point, good point. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, we have to do because uh, this integral just compute one part of the contribution, and we have a, we need a one more contribution. Thank you for comments. And then, so finally, we take S A is like area of gamma A divided by four G newton, which is looks like R over two G newton, and log of L over epsilon. But now we use the famous relation, uh, something called brown eno relation between ADS radius and central charge. And then this is just a 3 over C and log L over epsilon. So th this way we can reproduce what we know from CFT side. This is a, one of the simplest check. So these are story in static case. So now I also give some formula for more general case, which is holographic entanglement entropy in time dependent 
time-dependent setup, time-dependent space time. So this case, one problem is that we cannot take a simple weak rotation into Euclidean space. If we do naively, then we get an imaginary valued metric, which is not good. Also, in, on this kind of low range and space time, here we implicitly, right, we restrict everything down to time slice. So in that case, we can have a nice minimal surface. But if we are thinking full low range and space, if we go in a narrow direction, right, then area is just collapsed to zero. Right? It's very, this minimization maybe just gives very this singular surface, like narrow surface, but which is not good, actually. Doesn't, nothing related to the entanglement. So we have to be uh, very careful about the choice of some surface. We cannot just say minimum area surface. And instead, the uh, correct formulation is this one. This is uh, formulation which I worked with Veronica Fubeni and Mukundu Rangamani and one year later than that one. And so this case is really a two-step kind of argument. First, we do extremization. Uh, not necessarily minimum or not necessarily maximum. So we take an area of same surface gamma A. This is the same condition. So here, uh, boundary of gamma A is boundary of A, and uh, gamma A is homologous to A. And we take divided by 4G Newton, the same as Beckenstein Hawking again. We compute this. Anyway, and there are many several candidates of this guy. Then we pick up just minimum guy. Let's, let's call this a solution. So there are some solution. Solution to the extremal, this is a kind of differential equation, partial differential. We have to solve it. But the, you get some discrete number of solutions, then we have to take a minimum among them. So this is a formulation here. So we cannot initially start with some minimum or something. <coughs> yeah, so this is, this is the extreme, so extreme surface. This is called extremal surface. So that means just we compute area functional and just require its variation is zero. And the, yeah, actually the reason why we have extremal surface is like this. So you, you, you have in mind some, so you have, we have some Poincare metric and uh, let's uh, imagine some AJ3 for simplicity. We have some geodesic, right? In AJ3, extremal surface means just geodesic. Space like geodesic. <laughs> the space like geodesic. Space like. And uh, so if we think about some kind of time slice, then if we move this way, right, then indeed this is a minimum surface. But if we move in time like direction, right, so low range and space, it's like metric is different. It's like this way. If we move in t direction, it's it minus, right? So it's an uh, area actually minimize, uh, actually area decreases in this direction. But this direction is increases. So that means we have to maximize in this direction and minimize in this spatial direction. So that's the reason we need an extremal condition. And this is quite a manifest in another homerism, which is, uh, so this is a HRT 2007. They are equivalent, but uh, another homerism, which is formed by Alan Wall, which is uh, this another formulation, so it's directly so different. So this is time we, we call it also covariant holographic entanglement. Another covariant, this is equivalent to this. Around 2000. Well, this is actually quite useful to prove strong subjectivity for time-dependent backgrounds. This formula is not, from this formula, it's not easy to derive strong subjectivity like this. Because if we think about these two geodesic or two surfaces, they are not always in the same time slice. And, uh, but another formulation helps us to show this. So this SA, this is, maybe I'll put it for W. And this is uh, another two-step computation, but first we can do is minimization. So anyway, we, are, we want a something minimal, minimal surface. But here we have actually a minimum of a particular time slice. So we have in mind some, we have some Poincare, let's take the Poincare, but we can take some particular time slice. 
particular time slice, so which covers end on this boundary of A. Let's, let's call this the A. Right? This region is A. And uh, some surface, you can choose many different surfaces. You can also <coughs> choose this kind of surface, but always end on A. You can choose uh, if it remains, right? But let's fix one of the time slice. Then we can, on this time slice, we can talk about this kind of you know, minimal surface. Minimal surface. So this is uh, this condition. So we have some surface, but which only always lives on some particular time slice. This sigma is time slice. And the compute, and it's the same condition, right? So this is the same. So equal to gamma a, so a, homology condition. <coughs> this is a quite a stable calculation, because always in a space-like manifold with just minimal surface. And after that, of course, it result depends on the sigma, right? Choice of time slice, and we take a maximization about sigma, time slice. And this gives a holographic entanglement entropy in a covariant formulation. So these two guys are also proven to be sure. Equivalent. But the quick, quick you know, understanding is that here. You have to maximize here. This maximize is here, right? This sigma and the minimization is here. <coughs> Sorry? Oh, yeah, so maximum is a maximization of this, this guy by changing sigma, time slice. Uh, this, yeah, and uh, this guy is a just fixed time slice, right? And we have a region A. And we have some surface which cover region A, and we minimize the area. This is what this part tells us. And this two-step procedure. And the reason why this is quite, quite useful for, I mean, to prove strong subjectivity, is maybe I, I would like to show this here. <coughs> yes? Yeah. Sigma is at any time slice which end on the region A. Okay. So you have some time slice. This is ADS space. But let's fix one of the time slice. Then on this time slice, we can minimize the area. We can find minimal surface. But the problem is that the result depends on the choice of time slice. And then finally, take a maximum against any choice of sigma. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so then, proof of SSA in covariant case, we can do this in the following way, using this second formulation. This is also obtained by Alan Wall. And so we have some, we can imagine some Poincaré setup for the any, anything you like, actually. So as a boundary, it's very easy. So we have some A, B, C, right? We have three regions called A, um, A, B, C. Maybe a little bit more. C, and uh, here. This is some time slice, and we have A, B, C. And, but problem is, so if we think real surface, right, there, looks like this, and the, these two guys are, looks like this is gamma AB, and this is gamma BC, and they are not on the same time slice. It's not easy to, uh, not possible to find some slice which includes both of them. Because here it's they, in some sense they like intersect, not doesn't completely intersect, it's like slightly separated. So, but the idea is to start the opposite way. So we start with the answer. We start with answer. Answer means uh, this guy. We, let's start with this guy. So anyway, this is something good. The reason is so you can find some surface for B, right? And we can find some surface for A, B, C. Right? And, but uh, they don't intersect in some sense if we look from the top. So that means we can always find some time slice which includes both of them. So you can always, this, you know, for, there are also formal proof of this. You can have some sigma which includes both of them. So sigma includes gamma B and gamma ABC. So we, owing to that, so anyway, so we compute area of gamma B plus area of gamma ABC. <coughs> then 
Then on this sigma slice, we can easily prove this is the same as this static case. We can easily show uh, a b on this sigma and the area of this b c on this sigma. Okay. Up to this this inequality just same as that one. We fix some spatial time slice. So we have some surface, right? So we have some some surface which is looks like uh, like this and like this, right? So this is uh, on the same same surface sigma. So that's the reason I put sigma. But however, actually the real surface is different. Real surface is something similar, but it's a little different. Maybe it's going this way, and this is a real extremal surface. But nevertheless, because uh, if we remember that formulation, right, always correct one is a maximum against choice of sigma, so that means correct one is should be satisfied this inequality. So this way, in the end, anyway, we prove this strong subjectivity. So these are I mean, basic checks which we have to do for to believe you know in this entanglement entry. This is quantities of entanglement. But next I'd like to give a more direct derivation by using ADS CFT. <coughs> so this is a final C is some derivation, holographic derivation. It's by uh, Rukko Itz and Omarada Sena. But uh, there are some earlier discussion for size, which is really point out a very good point just after our proposal. But this Rukko Itz and Sena gives the most correct uh, derivation. So here we just use this uh, bulk to boundary relation, partition function is equal to each other in CFT and holography. So we start with uh, CFT partition function is equal to gravity, and gravity is, looks like simple, that exponential minus action is gravity. The action is, looks like Um, in Euclidean, I, I'm talking about Euclidean formulation. Uh, like this, so we have minus sign and G, uh, sorry, it's just G and R minus two cosmological constant and some, maybe sometimes we have, we need to include given the whole term, but th that doesn't contribute actually, so I don't write it. <coughs> and also there are scale, you can assume some scalar field or fermions, but they don't contribute. Only metric is important to com compute this. This is also closely related to the fact that somehow only gravity theory, if we think of a scalar field theory and the fermion theory and maybe gauge theory, so there are no classical contribution to entropy, but only at spin two. I mean, gravity theory has a I mean, kind of mysterious, mysteriously we have some classical contribution of entropy. This is a typical example of Beckenstein Hawking formula and more general. Uh, consequence is this holographic entanglement entropy. It's, we just come from classical GR. So that's, so that's the reason we, we can neglect also other contributions. And then, if we remember this replicatoric, so we are interested in this guy, and take derivative n, and uh, this is what we call Zn, Zn and Z1 to n's power because of normalization. So we want to anyway compute this guy in CFT, but this is equal to gravity, so let's do it. Let's compute this quantity. But this quantity, if we remember the basic picture, so we do some path integral calculation. Right? Then we have some, uh, yeah, let's take a region A is here. So we have this path integral and region A is here, like previous yesterday's computation. And then idea is to put some deficit, negative deficit angle such that we have n seat or our angle is 2 pi n. Right, so we have a two pi n angle. <laughs> a naive holographic dual, is, this is actually original argument by Hulsaif, but so we can just naively extend this deficit angle, 
into the bulk. Right? And we can evaluate action in this background, but this is not exactly correct because in general relativity, we don't like you know, this kind of singular geometry. There are actually actual solutions. Actually, for any integer n, we, there is an exact some, some nice solution which is a smooth metric. Always there are such a solution. Actually, we should use such a solution. So we have some smooth solution. Smooth solution. with 2 pi n periodicity on boundary, on, only on boundary, not, not in the bulk. There are some similar solution. Let's call it, so we have some. But however, this solution and uh, this naive solution, it's deficit angle solution. There are some 2 pi n bulk, uh, Maybe bulk deficit angle, which is given by delta equal to pi one minus n. I mentioned this yesterday. Solution. This is not exact good solution. The singular solution, but uh, naively we can come up with this. But uh, actually. It's like co conical singularity. You, you can just write this way. Uh, rho square d theta, but theta is periodicity to pi n. So we say it's a like conical singularity. Right? But uh, let's, let's pretend that. Actually, we get the correct answer. The reason, this difference is in some sense small. So if we plug this solution in this action, but we know so already uh, that at any core a, there are no singular. Right? So uh, this, let's call this is solution, let's call solution G, this is metric, right? And let's call this G2, right? And uh, G1 and G2 is of course coincide, right? And also their solution to Einstein equation. So that means, that means if we consider n greater than one, n different from one, and assuming some analytical continuation, we find this action, right, gravity action, gravity, so let's gravity action with this G1 minus G2 is actually uh, n minus one square order. Not, not, there are no linear contribution. The reason is that linear combination, linear contribution cancels because of the solution to Einstein equation. Right? So you can imagine some perturbation of IZ, but leading term is delta G and Einstein equation. Right? And already zero order satisfies Einstein equation. This term is gone. So it always this delta G square. So and delta G is proportional to because of this argument, n minus one. Right? So that way there are no uh, linear contribution. That is quite fortunate. Because only linear term contributes to entropy. Because we, you know, we, you remember this, we have one first derivative about n and that n equals to one. So, so this term only affects, only affects any entropy. But von Neumann entropy But, uh, but for, for Neumann entropy, we can neglect that difference. <laughs> and uh, of course, we have to be more careful about this kind of argument, but this Luko it's more than you, for details, you can look at Luko it's more than paper, but this is intuitively quite. <coughs> and then, so anyway, we, we can just pretend that everything is fine for this naive solution. And indeed, this naive solution is used to derive holographic formula by for Scythe. Then it is very easy. So for, for deficit angle, in, in deficit angle 
delta equal to pi minus n, find this rich scalar in some manifold. This manifold with a deficit angle, it's like always looks like uh, 4 pi, 1 minus n, and delta function. So let's, let's call this surface is gamma a. This deficit angle surface is gamma a. It's localized. It's a singularity is just localized on this surface. So it like, looks like a delta function. <coughs> but of course, there are other contributions, but they, they don't contribute to entropy. And then we compute this uh, gravity action for n seat case. Then right, we, we just put this factor. Then it's 4 pi, so minus 4 d newton. That means 4 d newton, n minus 1, and area, right? Then we get area of our gamma a. Because we have a curvature, right? But this becomes 4 pi, 1 minus n, and delta function. <coughs> and so, and then we can take derivative about n. So this we just compute. Entropy is like derivative of n and log of the n, the one to the n's. Right? So that means we can uh, del n and it's like minus. So it's like let's put plus then i n minus n i one. Right? But the i, I one is trivial because it's just zero. Right? So we get derivative and then for g newton area result appears, but this is not the end of the story. So then we, next we have to say this is a minimal surface, but that just come from Einstein equation. So is? Mm -hmm. oh, uh, you, you can compute it in directory, uh, basically. So you can regulate, right? So this is a singular surface, right? Original surface is like 2 pi n, right? But you can slightly modify this part as some smooth function which looks like R square in, uh, sorry, rho square in a little bit larger region, and, but it becomes, and uh, it becomes, uh, okay, so it's like rho square in rho is a little bit larger, but it's epsilon, then maybe n square, rho square. You can choose such an interpolating function, then there are no singularity, right? And then just compute it, then you get it. But you can also understand it's a kind of, a, right, so if you have some, um, n copy, so you can think that's kind of right, a lot of sphere, right? You have n copy of sphere and paste to each other, and if you apply gauss bonnet theorem, you can also derive this. There are many ways to derive this formula. <coughs> and yeah, okay, so it needs time, but just, uh, okay, I think that. So, Mention one more. <coughs> Jeez. Yeah, so let me mention holographic CFT. Just, just want to quickly finish. So here we assume some classical gravity, classical gravity, a gravity, and dual and a whole ADS in ADS, and this is dual to uh, something called holographic CFT. So this is a name, it's a large N and a large N or a large central charge, and they strongly coupled. So this is characterized by the spectrum, as we often say. There are some shellish black hole in 2D CFT. Let's think of 2D CFT. So above some energy scale, then we have a black hole states. There are quite a lot of states. This is a black hole state. But however, for below the state, there are some gap, and below the gap, so there are number of spaces quite sparse. Sparse spectrum. So this sparse uh, spectrum characterizes this holographic CFT, and there are, now there are many, many computations done, so started with this Hedrick. Hedrick's work, 2010, and uh, Hartman's result, 2013, and there are many, many works, including ours. 
And uh, so there are some, using this characterization, we can analytically compute, compute leading contribution to entanglement entropy, also as a quantity, like partial function and correlation in this large central charge CFT with very sparse spectrum. And I'm not going to detail, but just want to summarize consequence of this thing. This is actually a phase transition, actually already mentioned. So this phase transition phenomena, simplest case happens when we have in mind is like when subsystem A consists of two intervals. And in my lecture, I always assume that subsystem A is just one interval for 2D safety. But of course, why not we can consider some disconnected union, so two intervals. So this case, there are two contributions, two possibilities. So if they are uh, far apart, and if they are very close to each other, A1 and A2, so if they are far apart, minimal surface uh, looks like disconnected, right? This is the gamma A1, gamma A2. In this case, they are connected, right? This is A1, A2, both two, union of these two. And in this case, uh, mutual information a1 and A2 defined as SA1 plus SA2, SA1, A2, is actually zero, right? Because this guy, this SA1, we, here we just show the computation of SA1, A2, and just disconnect the same as some mention. But here, uh, A1, A2 is non-trivial, non-zero. It's positive, always this point. Because this guy is different from the other guy. This guy is larger. And uh, such a phase transition happens. And this is phase transition. This occurs because of large C, large N limit. So if you take a large N limit, or even originally smooth transition, smooth crossover behavior becomes very sharp phase transition. And this is indeed, this kind of a phenomena doesn't happen for standard CFT, but if you take large central charge CFT, so you can derive these properties, these according to these works. And one more thing is this inequality called monogamy of mutual information. So I just finish with this one. This is a one characterization of, this is a, some similar argument, similar to uh, strong subjectivity, but strong subjectivity known to be true for any quantum mechanics, monogamy of MMI, mutual information. This is a mutual information. So this is given, this is done by uh, Hedrick, uh, Hayden, uh, Hayden, Hedrick, and Maroni, 2011. This is a very interesting result that we consider mutual information between A, B, C is always larger than mutual information A, B, and A, C. Mutual information roughly measures the amount of correlation between two systems. Right, this is a basically related to correlation function between A1 and A2, universal way to formulate correlation function in quantum information language. And this is always, this is not necessarily true for any standard quantum state, but this is always true in, in holographic CFT. holographic entanglement entropy, leading order. So you can quickly show this. Uh, so this is ABC, and uh, this basically says that this summation is smaller than this guy. It's very similar to strong subrelativity proof. A and C and these guys. Uh, obviously, this surface covers CB, so it's obviously this is smaller, and this surface covers here, very similar. This is just equivalent, this statement. So definition of a mutual information like this. So, yeah, this means SA plus SB plus SC, if we write this, you know, in terms of entropy, AB, it's like symmetric BC, CA plus SBC. I think this is negative, right? This is probably, Negative, yeah, this is 
non-positive. So this is equivalent, and this is clearly shown. Picture. But if you see some particular state, something called uh, GHG state, for for part type GHG state, that means uh, square root two and zero 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 and uh, one, 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 one. So then, obviously, you can see this is violated. This state is up opposite sign because everything is the same value, log two. Everything is the same, log two. Right? Positive sign is larger than negative sign. So that way, this is somehow good characterization of the quantum state which we realize in holographic, some classical gravity limit of holography. Yeah, okay, so I just wanted to uh, finish here and continue next time. <laughs>